Like the idea is, isn't worth anything in the end. So if you have a great idea, that's cool, but try to find out what the, what the problem is that it's solving because your idea is gonna change yeah. a lot. This episode is brought to you by WHU, the Otto Beisheim School of Management. WHU is reshaping the way students learn about business, management, finance, and entrepreneurship through its innovative programs and partnerships in Germany and across the globe. To learn more about this globally ranked university, visit whu.edu today. Hi folks, Dries hier. Welcome to the newest episode of the Most Awesome Founder podcast. Today we have a special episode as we are recording the podcast on site on the Vellander campus of WAU in the presence of some very enthusiastic students. <laughs> At least that worked out, that's good. Today I'm happy to introduce to you Niklas Brakman of Primach. Niklas has conducted the Master in Entrepreneurship here at WAU and has co-founded uh, the company Prematch, an app that allows you to monitor everything that is happening in the exciting world of German amateur football. We are very happy to welcome Niklas Brackman back to the campus and we will hope and we hope you will enjoy the show. Coming to you from WHU <laughs> on the banks of the Rhine River in beautiful Fallendar, Germany. This is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. Niklas, first question. How does it feel to be back in Wallander in one of the lecture halls where I think you have been sitting uh, some years ago? Yeah, hello, thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, feels great, um, especially in front of these 500 students sitting here <laughs> and, uh, cheering for us. Yeah, nice to be back. Great. Um, in the podcast, as you might know, we always want to start with some personal storytelling. So can you tell us a bit about your background? Where are you coming from? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I was actually born in Cologne, uh, living there right now as well. Um, my family is living or was living close to the Dutch border, actually. Okay. So actually uh, born and raised some sort of rather on a, on a farm, on my granddad's okay. farm. <laughs> um, so really, yeah, more far away actually from like the city life and like it's all uh, startup land, if you want to like that, uh, where we are right now. Um, but really like good childhood, like yeah. easy and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun living there. And then at some point we moved to Cologne and uh, also went to school then here and uh, built basically my entire social circle here um yeah okay and so wh when you actually finished high school uh, did you have a clear idea of what you wanted to become at that point already or wh what was your idea at that point in time uh actually yeah um but it was far from what i'm doing now okay. <laughs> i was actually um i was actually like actually uh, until after my a levels i was always thinking about um doing an apprenticeship and to to become a carpenter <laughs> so actually, you never really thought about about studying actually, um, because yeah, I was like, yeah, basically raised to like build stuff, and all my family was always like trying to to do things, and all the on the on the farm we were all like always like um, yeah fixing things, and it was like very very different from what what I uh, would usually do probably. Um, so I found it always quite nice to to build things, uh, I think. Um, and yeah, that was like the original plan, which in the end then did not turn out to, to be the, the, the path to go. Yeah, and, and do you have an explanation how you then ended up at WAU doing the Master in Entrepreneurship? It seems to be quite a distance between first wanting to be a carpenter and <laughs> ending up here in Wallander. Yeah, that's true. That's far away. It uh, wasn't direct route, I'd say. Um, so probably um, the, the idea of doing like some with, something with like uh, woodcrafting or something still was uh, after A levels, I said, okay, if I want to do that, I st at least I need some sort of business knowledge because I don't just want to become a carpenter to work for somebody. But then, if I want to do it, I want to like some sort of build my own stuff and stuff. Um, and therefore, I said, okay, it might make sense to get at least some basic business knowledge to maybe even study because studying is nice. You can have a good time there um, and say, okay, hey, I'm living in Cologne. Cologne's a good city to do that. Um, let's do let's do an undergrad studium there, uh, studies there. Um, three years, and then after that, I'm gonna do what what I actually wanted to do, but with the skill set that I got from there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in the end, then realized that there are also parts to 
uh, yeah, business that might be related to building stuff, which is then entrepreneurship. Um, so I never really was too much enthusiastic about like all the other business topics uh, in, in general management and stuff like that. But the things that were related to entrepreneurship, um, new products, new yeah innovations to some extent, they kind of struck my mind because I felt like, hey, okay, cool, you can actually you can you can build stuff without you getting your hands dirty. Yeah. So that was also nice. Um, and then yeah, in the end, uh, worked for some startups, um, got deeper and deeper into the ecosystem, talked to people. Um, that were also like founding their companies in Cologne, um, and then over some some more uh, back and forth came here to, to the VU campus for the Master in Entrepreneurship. Um, also because a friend of mine did it in the first batch, like Lucas Pauli, oh, okay. um, also heavily recommended it to me, and yeah, that's probably how it turned up here. Okay, <laughs> and. As we are here in front of some students, do you have any anecdote about your years at WAU that you really want to share? Oh, my my uh, time at WAU has been really short, to be honest, because uh, it's been like five months, I think. Okay. Um, because then also like the COVID, oh, uh, yes, COVID time struck. Um, but I, I definitely remember some some good parties in the in the Keller here. I remember some good Euromasters. Uh, I remember some. Some good stuff that might be better not to talk about on the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> you but don't yeah. want to officially disclose that yeah, kind we of We can talk about it after, after the session, but it was, it was a good time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. And so, as I understood, uh, when you were writing your master thesis, the idea for pretty much emerged. Can you tell us a bit about how it exactly came to life, this idea about pretty much? Yeah, the idea is actually uh, even older than, than my time at the master thesis. So it was an idea by my co-founder, Lucas. Okay. Um, so we saw it together at the University of Cologne. Um, so he actually came up with the idea and approached us back then when we were just friends. And like, it's just one of, of these topics that you talk about. Yeah, hey, let's let's build a, build a company. And then you come with one idea, you come with the next one and the other one. And then in the end, you don't do any of these. Um, but this, this idea pretty much was the one that always followed him basically i'd say yeah. uh, and he he really uh it stick to his mind i'd say and then by the time i finished my masters we actually got back together and had a chat about it and uh yeah over like some conversations and actually working on the topic for for some while we actually said hey like yeah let's go for it that's uh, the thing we want to do that we always thought about so hey let's go yeah and um for the people that don't know pre-match can you explain briefly what Prematch is actually offering? So if I download your app, uh, what do I exactly get from you? Yeah. Mm, so I assume you are heavily invested in football, and especially <laughs> amateur football. So uh, for you, the app is highly recommendable. Um, in the end, basically, Prematch is the, and you could say probably the biggest uh, social platform for grassroots football in Germany uh, as of now. So... Basically, what we offer you is that if you are a player, uh, we give you everything that you need to know about your greatest passion. So we get all the news, score, statistics, and especially the statistics part is what we double down on. Because obviously there are some solutions which provide you with some news, some statistics about your team. Um, but the thing that's very, very different for amateur football is that it's very much more related to the people and the players themselves, actually. So I don't know if you have like, a favorite club in professional football. Yeah, it's a exotic Belgian club. So, <laughs> which one? Which one is it? Uh, it's uh, Centrale. They are not top five. Are they? No, they're not top five. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, fair. And do you have a favorite player then as well? Um, oh, a favorite player. Yeah, as a Belgian person, I think Lukaku is of fair. course. Uh, no. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Okay, cool. So then you have your like your favorite play, uh, your favorite club. Yeah, in yeah. in the Belgian league. Um, and you might even have some favorite players over there, but as soon as they switch the club, that doesn't mean that you also switch with them. You stay with your club because you have some emotional connection to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for for grassroots football, it's very different. I don't know how many of you here in the, in the crowd have been playing, but uh, how many are playing amateur football here? <laughs> well, <it's like laughs> Two hundred and fifty. <laughs> nice, cool. So um, yeah, you have you have these personal connections. That's what I'm what I'm trying to refer to. So when your best friend is playing for a local village club, then you are kind of interested in how they play because your friend's playing there. Yeah. yeah. And if your friend gets the right card, you want to know because you want to tease him about it. So, but as soon as like your best friend is then switching to another club, you are switching with him. Like this old club is not interesting to you anymore, but no. you are interested in his new club. So it's always about the players, always about the social connections in the end. 
Um, and that's why we are so doubling down on, on the players themselves, not on teams compared to other platforms. Yeah, okay, great. Maybe a, a question for the audience. How much of you have heard about pre-match or have downloaded the app? Oh, that's, that's such a lie. very interesting. Not, <laughs> so not that many amateur football players, but apparently pre-match is very yeah. known. That is good. Yes. Let, let's maybe delve a bit deeper into that because actually uh, you launched, I think, around August, August of this year, uh, the app, if I understood, in Germany-wide. Exactly, uh, yeah. We, we launched last year, actually, in August for like okay. one test region. Yeah. And did a little, little of testing iteration, but actually the big Germany launch was, was this August. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, you quite quickly ended up on the number one spot in the App Store. That's true. Which is, I would say, a remarkable achievement. And of course, now the, the logical question that everybody wants to know, how did you do that? <laughs> a lot of hard work. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, the one thing you have to say, <laughs> That's right? That's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but like, I, I'd say uh, a combination of, of different things. So on one side, we had a lot of time to prepare, right? So not in the sense of uh, moving slow, but in the sense of really going deep into the numbers, looking deep at what, what the people actually want to have. So as already mm -hmm. said, we actually started one year earlier with like testing, validating with users. And we actually started doing that even earlier without an app. So, okay. Um, when we, we started in early 2021 with a prototype or like website and like just simulating services. So we are actually already, I'd say, two years into user exploration, okay. but only four months live in Germany. Yeah. So uh, we had a lot of, of time to learn from what users actually want to have. And, and, uh, and just yeah, looking please. back at that, do you think you were too slow or was it perfect timing? Mm. So there was like, I think we could have done it half a year earlier, but there was also COVID in between. So okay. the seasons were paused. Yes, and like of then course. after the take up, um, we are not sure whether it makes sense to start without the momentum of amateur football being played everywhere, which we now had in August because everybody was just like waiting to get back on the pitches and everybody was like super pumped up. Yeah. Like, hey, getting on the, getting on the pitch again and like playing with friends again. Um, so that's why we decided to take the momentum there. We could have done it a little earlier, um, which I would usually always vote for as well, like being as fast yeah. as possible. Um, but for this time and like given the special yeah, surroundings, it made sense to us. Okay. And so, yeah, so you had the big launch in August. You immediately make a big splash. So how did you achieve that? Yeah. Um, I think the, the key to this was activating the clubs for us. Okay. Um, so we actually put a lot of effort in... Um, trying to identify the persona and the clubs that can leverage our reach. So obviously what you, what you can do if you want to build a huge reach fast, then you can try to build up yourself. Yeah, you can try to build up social accounts, um, try to spend a lot of money on ads and stuff like that. Um, but actually what you also can do is try to find the audience somewhere else and try to leverage that. And that's what we also try to do is basically, for example, every football club in Germany, uh, also like the lowest leagues, they always have an Instagram account. Yeah. Where they post stuff and like it's the most stupid thing. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's fine to see actually. Um, but every like of these Instagram uh, accounts has like 200 followers, 250 followers, yeah? Which is, one of them isn't that important. But actually if you have 25,000 clubs and like about 35,000 accounts, yeah. <coughs> then that's a hell lot of reach that you can generate if you can target them right. And the actually, like the only person that you need to target for us was actually the uh, the social media manager of yeah. these clubs. So actually, you only need like one contact person in the clubs to then own the reach of all the clubs in Germany. Um, and that was like a big, big growth hack for us. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just <coughs> building your own social platform; it's actually leveraging the social platforms of the football clubs, and in that way, actually getting uh, what we would call virality. Uh, reality, like, reality, yeah. And it's not only about Instagram. Um, for example, you can also think about WhatsApp. Um, so every, like, I don't know how many people played football or do any other team sports, but usually how this works is that a lot of people are, like every team sport is organized in WhatsApp groups, right? They're writing messages, hey, when's the training? Hey, where do we have to go? Um, when, who can pick me up and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's also the thing that once you get into the WhatsApp group with any hook, like saying, hey, there's this app called Prematch, then you're again multiplying your reach, right? Because but, like, but how do you get into the WhatsApp groups of people? That sounds a bit creepy. That's, that's a big question. WhatsApp group of people. 
Mm. So you don't have to, to be in there personally. Um, okay. You just have to create values or information um, or hooks that uh, are so strong that people say, hey, I actually want to share that with my friends because it gives me some sort of like a social currency, maybe. And can you um, give an example of such a hook? Uh, yeah, like for example, for us, uh, one major hook is the market value that we assign to any player on the platform. So basically, what we did is every player in Germany, even in the lowest league, they get a market value like the like the professionals do based on their performance stats. Okay, so and I'm, then, when I'm a guy with a belly of 40 kilos and eating sausages every day, I still get a market value from you guys. That's you will get a market value from us, okay. and uh, it's all solely based on your performance stats. So like this, that's maybe an important point. Um, all the players in Germany, all the teams, all the performance stats, like who played when, who scored the goals, who got substituted, they are all um, yeah, basically collected centrally yeah. uh, on different platforms in Germany, and you can aggregate them and then use them okay. in order to leverage them to build market values. Um, and there was kind of a big hook. If you can say, hey, guys, like I'm worth 5K, and Dries, sorry for you, but <laughs> you are always sitting on a bench, you're only worth one and a half K. So yeah. what's, what's happening there? So yes, you can imagine there are like strong uh, social dynamics in these WhatsApp groups. Yeah. That was helping us a lot. Yeah, okay. So it's a kind of gamification <coughs> based on the statistics that you can get from free from all kinds of databases that are generated. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and I actually, I saw recently on LinkedIn that, that you guys also created your own football club. Yeah, true. What, what was the reason behind that? Um, like we could say it was purely strategic, but obviously also fun, plays a role. So um, almost all of our team played uh, in, in their youth time, played over the last years, and then it sometimes stopped, how it usually is, uh, also when you go to study or somewhere else. Um, we all want to go back to the pitch, so that was one reason. Um, and the other one is also that we always try to be as close to users, actually, to our user base as possible. Yeah. And there's like no better place than on the actual football pitch and then playing against them and seeing how, how the dynamics are. Um, it's actually kind of kind of funny because nobody in our league knows that we are pre-match. Okay. Um, even though also, we, you we keep are it a secret. <laughs> you keep it a secret. Yeah, we keep it a secret. Also, like, the association doesn't like it when... Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's, it's a really good way to actually engage with your users in a non... Uh, artificial way so whenever you try to interview users it's very artificial right so yeah. you're asking people hey how do you like this how do you like that and they always are kind of yeah, trying not to insult you and they're giving you different responses from when you just ask them questions right yeah. and if you're then uh, on after the on after the match you're sitting next to them uh, with a beer and then ask them hey what are, what apps are you actually using and they're yeah. saying yeah here's this app called pre-match you check this out and you're like I don't know what's that <laughs> Yeah, okay. So instead of doing kind of artificial customer interviews, you're just immersed on the football pitch and then uh, during a beer after the match, you really try to see the pain points. Or water, yeah. Or water, yeah. Sure. <laughs> the pain points that uh, the players are experiencing with your app or what they're actually enjoying from your app. Okay. Absolutely. Like we are also doing a lot of interviews, obviously, okay. because you can't do it without. Um, but it's a nice add-on. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and maybe a, a question in between, because I can imagine that creating such an app um, requires quite some coding. And I would say our WAU students are good in a lot of things, but I would not say that coding is on the number one list, simply because, yeah, we are a business school, so we are not a, a coding school. How Do you have the necessary skills to code yourself? How did you learn them? Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely not. Okay. Um, so I did Le, Le Wagon uh, during my studies, so I've feel like I got some basic knowledge and like understanding of how processes work in coding. Yeah. Um, but I would never call myself a coder. Okay. Um, but uh, luckily, our third co-founder, Fite. Yeah. Great guy. A guy. He actually built up uh, a, an AI startup for seven years at, oh, okay. after his time at MTH. So uh, he already went through the process um, and yeah, he's yeah. a brain. So okay. you can definitely rely on him. And then also like over time we got, got some other people involved because that's like a topic that people are passionate about. Yeah. that people can get enthusiastic about, uh, which is really, really uh, worth much in the early stages because resources are always scarce. You can't really offer people lots of money or something. Yeah. So you have to offer them passion, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and how do you try to create that kind of passionate culture in, in your startup? Mm, that's a hard question, actually. Mm. 
I don't think there's a recipe. Yeah. So I think it's really you are you're passing on the values that you're self, uh, like you yourself are living up to. I think. Yeah. Um, and that's basically the culture that you can create. So I don't think that you can create a culture that's not in line with who you are actually. Um, so. I wouldn't say that culture is something that you can create by yeah. any means. So it's not that, hey, okay, now we're going to do step A, B, C, and then we're going to have culture X. Yeah. yeah. But it's rather like the, the kind of people you throw together into a room, they're going to create a culture without actually thinking about it. And then you can tweak on some parts and like contribute to that. Um, but the culture is actually going to be always driven by the people who work on something by, by nature. So. Yeah, so you cannot really design it? I don't think so, no. No, Okay. And, and does that mean that the, the three co-founders, would you say that you all kind of represent the same values and that that helps you to build the culture? Or, or is there still diversity in the norms and values that you guys have? Um, not in the values, I think. I think okay. in the values we are very, very similar. Um, I think we are completely different persons. Yeah. Like very, very different kind or like ways to think or ways to yeah, analyze things, um, which is good because then you get different perspective on, on topics. Um, but mm -hmm. like for the fundamental values, it's, it's very similar. And this was also like very important to us in the beginning to like talk about what are the values, what do we want to create, like how do we not only work together, but who, who are we? Yeah. Um, and it's definitely like one of the most important things I'd say in the, in the beginning phase, because you need to rely on the people yeah. that you don't even know that long, maybe. So you don't, it's not family, it's not your school friends, but it's people that you go along uh, with very well, probably, um, that you got to, yeah, got to know along the way. Um, and then you enter in, into this, I don't know, marriage kind of thing. <laughs> so you have to rely on the people, and that's like yeah. where values come in place. Okay, and then can you give an example of a core value that you guys share? Mm, humility thing. Okay. Mm. And humidity, all it, all it humidity like, seems yeah. for me a quite a difficult value if you're number one in the App Store. <laughs> How do you stay yeah. uh, with your feet on the ground in that yeah. kind of situation? No, you're, no, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, no, I think it's like what, what you are representing. So obviously when, when you get these successes, I'd call them now, or like these wins, um, getting number one in the App Store is amazing. It's cool. It's like, especially for the team, it's great because then you can actually give them something back for the work they put in. You always, yeah. you're motivating the team about like, hey, once we get this, this is going to be amazing. But actually, uh, the, the points where you can actually show them, hey, look at this, what we created, they are more rare. And yeah. that's where, where these things come in handy. Um, I think it's always about um, not getting too involved in the wins, but actually after that, getting back to back to work again, like yeah. thinking, okay, what's, what's the next step now? So we, we are ne uh, nothing where we want to be and uh, always getting back to what the, the bigger goal is. Yeah. yeah. And, and so if you look back at the past two years, uh, you have been hustling hard, I would say, uh, and reached some first successes. But if you look back, what, what do you think was the hardest part of this trajectory until now? Oh, this, this, this hard question. I think the, uh, <laughs> the hardest part is always still in front of you <laughs> because okay. you're like, it is, um, it's really like that. So you are, you start with something, you are purely uh, enthusiastic about something, you have this idea and you say, okay, that's going to be next great thing. And then you are come to a realization and say, okay, I don't know nothing. Like, where should I start? What I have, I don't have a clue. Like I study business, I study entrepreneurship. Now I'm here and I don't, where, don't know where to start. Um, and I think the, at some point, you realize that you will never get to the point where you have it figured out. So still today, I wouldn't say that we have everything under control, that I, we exactly know what to do. And that's totally fine. Today, we say, okay, yeah, that's just the way it is. Because once you, you get to a point where you know how things work, you just pass it on to somebody else and then start working on the next thing where you don't know how it works yet. Yeah. So we have to figure out new things constantly, um, which is nice, which is interesting. But you never get to the point where you're comfortable in what you're doing because you're doing everything for the first time. So yeah. I think, the, yeah. There's always hard parts, but there's always going to be harder parts in the future. Yeah, and then so for taking the next step, eh? so you were saying, look, it's, it's always the next step is always the hardest part because you don't know, you have never done it before, so yeah. you have to learn it. Do you search for advice for that kind of steps? A lot, yeah, definitely. And, and who is giving you advice then? Mm, I think 
depends very much on situation and the kind of uh, task you add. So obviously, if you are in the midst of any business-related uh, issues or anything where you say, okay, I need somebody who has experience with uh, this business situation, then, for example, our angel investors come in okay. place and they are very, very supportive, which is amazing because they help us a lot over the past months still now. So that's that's great to see. If there are like um, personal situations, then you're asking your friends and your family. Um, you might even ask your co-founders about some stuff. Um, so it really much depends on, on the situation. Um, but in the end, you always end up asking for advice because you will not figure out the things yourself. And you have, you can, you have to come to, uh, to this um, realization that you can't do that. And from that point on, it's, it's easier yeah. because then you can just ask. Yeah, it's interesting that you mention angel investors because I think I often hear a lot of discussion among founders, but also among investors about what is the role of angel investors? Should their role be restricted to just being the first generation of investors in your startup? Or should you should angel investors also actually try to help you in a strategic way? And I think both options have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, what would be your opinion about that? Mm, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have like a strong opinion on that because I think every startup needs a different approach. Probably um, for us, we are heavily reliable on support of the angel investors in a strategic way as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, like, if we are very honest with ourselves, we are all first-time founders. So, yeah. um, and in the beginning, that was yeah really helpful to get some people on board who were like supporting with like the, the early stages. So right now, we got some stuff figured out, and that's good. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, they can't support you on, on different stuff anymore. So for us, I'd say like it's it's very important to get feedback as well. Um, not always only advice, but also feedback and like seeing how things work out, and like also we're asking them in regular rhythms how happy they are with our progress in order to like reflect on that and not only say, oh, we are the greatest or we're the worst, but like actually get ob the objective feedback. Um, and yeah, you can, you can do a lot of, with them. You can do little with them. And it always depends on what you personally think is, is the best for you. Yeah, okay. And, and maybe to make it even broader, because I remember uh, that with pre-match, you were actually involved in quite some VR activities. Huh? So I think you participated in this three-day startup boot camp, you were in the first quarter of the VAU Accelerator. I remember that you pitched once on Idealab. So quite uh, some uh, active involvement there. Can you explain a bit what is actually what has been the added value for you guys of that kind of activities? If there is any, yeah. So if, it's, <laughs> if there is no added value, please be honest about it. But, but did it help you in one way or another, these kind of activities? Actually, yeah, now that, that you call this out, I find it quite funny because I think in all these events, we 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 came in with different ideas. Like okay. it's always, always related to pre match, but like the idea that we came there was always different, which is kind of interesting because I think um, the actual idea that you come up with is, is not really the important part. It's like always, we were always trying to, to solve a similar problem. So like the problem is very, very important. You have to stick to that um, and the market probably. But the idea is, is not really that, that decisive. Um, so the, I think the way that, uh, we helped us a lot or like all these events was getting a whole bunch of feedback in a very short amount of time. For example, I can, I can call out all of them, but uh, the accelerator is, is a very good example. So in the first two weeks, you basically get exposed to like 80 mentors no. who, uh, are so there's their sole purpose is there to let you pitch in front of them and then rip you apart. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're doing that for two weeks constantly and then uh, you get out of every day and you're like, okay, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we, we're doing just like the worst thing ever. Yeah. And then you, you fix something to tweak on, on your pitch a little bit. And then you say, okay, no, no, now we got it. And you start until next day and it's, you're going to be ripped apart again. <laughs> like, like after a couple of days, you realize, okay, it doesn't really matter um, what we're saying here because you're always going to find some things that still can be improved. Um, and you also get like positive feedback a lot. Yeah. Um, and then from time to time you realize, okay, it's not really about the idea itself or the problem itself, but it's about how you present it to the people and that there are like different personas that you have to present in different ways and like um, the, the way you interact with your own idea and with your own problem that you're trying to solve, um, you wouldn't get there by doing it on your own. You're only getting it or getting there by yeah, gathering a lot of feedback and like also feedback that hurts. Yeah. Um, so the best thing about VR activities then is that they hurt, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but 
uh, or uh, you could say they push you to make the next move and yeah, think about probably. it. And maybe the other way around, huh? because uh, you did hear the master in entrepreneurship, uh, and and uh, we have we don't have the podcast here to glorify the AU. So if you now maybe look back and you look at your time here in the master in entrepreneurship, can you see something that you think, oh, this is something that we didn't learn and we should have learned in the master? Mm. That you think, look, actually, this is a crucial skill to have as an entrepreneur. And actually, in my time at WAU, we didn't spend that much time on that. Yeah, I, I don't know, like, 20 things probably. <laughs> that, that, that would help you technically yeah, in, yeah. in life, but it's it's hard to simulate then. Like if there's one thing that I feel would definitely help a lot of people in, in the early stages, but I don't know whether this is actually possible to simulate in university environment is to uh to get into this do or die situations. Like to okay. really like have responsibility for what you're doing, right? Because like every time you do like let's say you you have to build an idea in your university classes, right? And at yeah. some point you have to pitch and maybe there's also some some investors coming by and you have to pitch in front of them and there's a lot of pressure on you, obviously. Um, but in the end, you can still go out there, off there and nothing happens, yeah. right? Like, nothing. <laughs> some, some grading might be involved. Some grading, yeah. Some grading, <laughs> yeah. yeah, some grading might be involved. But in the end, it's like um, the, the situation that um, we, for example, right from the beginning got into is always the situations where I feel like, okay, if, if I mess this up now, then... This is this might be the last time that we could work on this on this topic for like the foreseeable future, um, and if there was a way to kind of simulate that, really like getting into situations where you might even mess up, yeah. um, and then have the chance to get to, to this to this point, realizing okay, yeah, I messed up, but like I can still move on with that. Yeah. I think that's something that yeah, is is hard to teach, but that would really help a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so would have helped me. To, to use a football metaphor, it's almost like it would be great to learn what it means to take a penalty during the World Cup, something like that, no? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Only that we're only doing grassroots football. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, maybe um, to wrap up a bit, um, if you look back a bit uh, and you should give yourself advice uh, two, three years ago, what advice would you give to yourself two, three years ago? Mm. Probably the one thing that I that I brought up earlier, uh, you will never have it figured out. <laughs> so and that's totally fine. Yeah. That's probably the second important part. So you will never get to a situation where you have the feeling of control. Yeah. So uh, that's really good. Um, and the part about the the solution, the idea, like the solution is never the like the idea is, isn't worth anything in the end. So if you have a great idea, that's cool, but try to find out what the, what the problem is that it's solving because your idea is going to change yeah. a lot. But maybe to delve a bit into this thing about you're saying you should accept that you're not in control. Mm -hmm. That feels very scary to me that, that you... It is. That, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so how do you try to deal with that? Mm. Because you don't want to go in your bed every evening and lay there and think like, oh my God, this is out of control and I have no control on it, no? I think like the, there's a difference. Like obviously it depends on your personal situation a lot. Yeah. So I'd say, and I'd speak for most of students here uh, who have like limited responsibilities in life, I'd say, and like they can still, like we can all still try things out without, even if we mess up there's not too much risk involved. Like it's personal risk, obviously. Yeah. We don't take responsibility for too many other people. Okay. Of us. So that's like the one thing. Um, the same thing that is, is crucial or has been crucial to me, I think, or us, is having a good a good team, especially in the founder team. And like, because you will get to these to these points or like to these realizations at different points in time. You feel like, okay, I have this not in control, and then you can get to the others. And that's, if you have a good funny team, they can lift you up. Um, and then you create, and, yeah, you basically yeah. grow together even more, and then like lift yourself up. So when one guy is flipping out, then the other two it's can bring down that again. the other ones can calm him down. Okay. Most of the time, yeah. yeah. So that's really helpful. Okay. I would, for example, I would also never, never found a company on myself. Yeah. Um, especially for this reason, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, in terms of inspiration, do you have any suggestions of books or music or podcasts <laughs> that you would recommend to our listeners? 
Except for this podcast here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's without any uh, debate. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I don't think, like, yeah, probably. Um, nothing to do with entrepreneurship, though. So <laughs> <laughs> That's not a problem. That's not a problem. So, uh, I've, I've, for example, I've been growing up with a lot of hip-hop music, so that's what I can definitely recommend everybody, and you learn a lot about uh, entrepreneurship maybe as well if you want to build the bridge at some point. <laughs> um, but there are, like, a lot of, lot of great artists right now. Um, and for books, maybe uh, one book that I that just read was uh, Alles zu Ernst geworden. I don't know if you know that. No. It's like uh, in, in English, it's uh, Every Scotten Series Lately. Um, okay. It's kind of, kind of a nice book. It's just like an easy read uh, about like personal, it's basically a conversation in written form from like uh, two guys just talking some stupid stuff. Okay. Um, and just reflecting on yeah, a couple of things uh, on, of, of day to day. So it's kind of funny. It's kind of a good read. Uh, I can recommend that. Okay, great. Brings Thanks it down, counts it down. <laughs> <laughs> we will put it in the show notes, as we always say. Oh, so and then uh, I should have said something different. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Niklas, thanks for uh, willing to come to the Vallander campus and uh, be you. here and uh, answer some questions. Uh, I found it really interesting to hear what you guys are doing, how you are doing it. And that despite, I would say, all the success that you're having at the moment, that you also see still some challenges ahead. And I wish you all the best of luck with these challenges, I would say. Thank you so much. So thanks for being here and thanks for the audience for listening. Thank you. Thank you.